Well, Cynthia is here, so I always love seeing you, Cynthia. I'm so glad you're back. And then let's see, Alexandra is here. I don't, Alexandra, is this your first time? Hi, yeah, it is my first time. I actually just heard you speak on the Clever podcast and that's how I found out about this. And I just really wanted to join in because I really loved that episode. Oh, so cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And um, let's see, Sandy. Thank you for hosting me. Hi, these. Sandy. Sure. Sandy, did I see you before? Or is this your first time? I saw you before. Welcome back. And let's see. Rickin, is that you? Am I saying yes. that right? Yeah, Rickin. Welcome. I've been following you for a while. But first, virtual tea. You finally followed me to tea. That's really you cool. Finally, you finally, we're finally having tea time. All right. I love it. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and Todd, you're back. Good to hey, see Aish. you, Todd. Great to see you, Aish. Yeah, really nice to see you. And Johannes is here, my friend. Hey. Hey, Aisha. How are How you? How are you? <laughs> Johannes is a master of deconstruction, reconstruction in a different medium. Am I right, Johannes? Yes. <laughs> everything with and sound and music. Everything with sound and music. Yeah, that's lovely. Hi, Brian. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Liz, good to see you. Welcome. And then Phoebe. Nice to see you. Hi, how are you? I am Good fine. To see wow, you. you have a beautiful voice. You need, you you. need to, to read uh, the quote when it comes up. <laughs> I'm, I'm requesting that. All oh, right. Susan is here. Hi, Susan. Nice hey, Aisha? Yeah. Aisha? Yes. Can I ask Ashley. you something? Hi. How do you do the, um, like, I can, if I hit on participants, I'm using my phone, then I, is it possible uh -huh. to see a gallery view? Because I see, like, um, people's avatars, but I don't see, like, the people. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Oh, on, and uh, this is on your phone? Yeah, maybe I just can't do it. I'll just go off the avatars. That's no, fine. Here, um, on the phone, you just need to slide it to the right. Then you should be able to see people. Oh yeah, thank you. Woohoo. Cool. Meltan the mastermind. Yay. <laughs> Ashley, you just demonstrated something that I do all the time when I get stuck. Which is which is I reach out to Meltan. <laughs> ah. uh -huh. God damn, I hate that. Oh cool. Yeah. And Isabel is here. I love it. Okay. Uh, and Seda is my timekeeper, time police. Seda, how, how are we doing? We should um, pull everyone together, right? Wow. Yes. And this happened before with another goddamn job right. application. Uh -oh. Somebody mute, needs uh, to go on mute. Muse, please. Yes. Or I can put everyone on mute. Let's see. Uh, I'm doing it. It's okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Let's so. see those. Do you all want to hold up your drawings so we could look at them together? You're the, the reconstructed portraits. Wow. Oh my God, these are so amazing. Love it, love it, love it. Beautiful. My apologies to John and I didn't come anywhere close to capturing Ibru's beautiful hair. Is that Scott talking? Yes. <laughs> You'd think I could but draw my old roommate John better than that, but I, I tried my best to capture Ebru's hair. <laughs> it looks great from here, Scott. But there are so many beautiful ones that, um, may I invite everyone to send their portraits to us, please? Just take a picture and um, put it in the mail. And then we can brag about it. And hi, Terry. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, here comes the quote. So let's see. Where is my volunteer?
Phoebe, Phoebe, you're my volunteer. You want to read the quote? Let's see, we need to unmute you. There we go. Okay. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the father of Little Prince. Yes. Phoebe, you did a beautiful job. Thank you so much for taking me up on that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's continue. In the uh, spirit of Little Prince, well, we, we, did the we did the drawing part, so um, Little Prince is happy. Now we're going to reconstruct. And what is reconstruction? It's really recognizing that um, when we deconstruct something, and in this case, our life and work, we, when we're reconstructing, we need to make some choices. We can't have everything, right? Um, so just like my baklava example, I can't have the filo dough that I find in Turkey, but I do find good bread here. So I'm going to um, keep the pistachios and the sugar and the butter, but I'm going to change, change it to bread. And what I'm going to avoid is... Uh, maybe being too critical of it because it's not going to be quite like the Turkish baklava, but it's going to be something new. So with that, we're playing with ideas. How are we going to reconstruct our life? Um, let me show you the example because that will speak for you know, um, all of us. What we're going to do is we're going to reconstruct our life across these four dimensions of our life, family, work, well-being, and friendship. And these four things come, these the four dimensions, come to us from the year-long research we've done with older Americans, people who are 65 and older, who are incredibly wise uh, about um, life, because they have so much experience. And they've told us basically there are four things in life that matter. Love, work and purpose, so purpose, um, friendship and well-being. So we decided to use those four um, quadrants in a way, those four dimensions to help us reconstruct our life. And Frank Wagner is an amazing executive leadership coach um, he came to one of my sessions and gave us this beautiful example. And what I love about it is, um, for example, the way he talks about family. You pick three things that you personally feel is essential to your family. For him, it's being there for them, being a positive example, being vulnerable. And then you add one thing you, va you want to avoid. So he wants to avoid being too important in their lives. So you get the idea. And then you do the same thing for work. Three essential ingredients of your work going forward and one thing that you want to avoid. For Frank, adding too much value is one of the things he wants to avoid. And I love that. Um, same thing for well-being and for friendship. And with that, let's... Um, you know, we're working very fast, so I'm going to give you five minutes also because you're just amazingly talented. Um, but when you have a limited amount of time, you go with your gut feeling. You can't really um, judge your uh, decisions. And that's every, exactly what I want um, to avoid, that you start judging yourself. So let's do it. Um, so that let's go back to the um, Frank's example because it's a good one to... Um, kind of either borrow from or be inspired by. Okay, thank you. Five minutes, four minutes, Aisha. <laughs> See, this is what I love about Seda. Okay, Seda says four minutes. Let's try. Yeah. All right. Yeah. One minute per, uh, per dimension. And that gives us a lot of time afterwards to speak. Mm -hmm. 
And so as you're doing that, remember that we're using our chat box as our collaboration tool. So feel free to actually put your answers directly into the chat box and you can say family, work, well-being, friendship, and then just three things to include, one thing to avoid for each. All right. I love the uh, the Bakala conversation that's going on in the uh, in the chat box. A lot, lot of recipes there, yes. A lot of recipes there. Yeah, hala hala klava. So, um, Liz, when you say, can you post the worksheet? Um, I don't understand. Oh, this there you one. go. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, you could also take a picture of the worksheet if, you, if you'd like. Let's see. Oh, Ken is here. Hi, Ken. Good to see you. Everyone, Ken Carbone, my friend, is going to be one of our guests coming up. What did we say, Ken, next week or in two weeks? Let's see, I can't hear you. October 14th. Next week. Yay! I love it. Right, last um, couple minutes. Oh, there's some really great uh, chat going on. Thank you for um, putting those in. Family, unconditional love, forgiven, forgiveness. We give always. Be there through roller coaster rides of life. Avoid criticism. All right, I also, in between those, um, posted the baklava challenge. Make the new baklava, take a photo and send it to me and I'm going to post it on Instagram. Christine and says, like, have fun in all four dimensions. I like that. Yeah, nice. That sounds like Christine. Oh, Ashley, um, you might want to write it to the entire group instead of um, me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I do that all the time. And I'm like, why is it not posting? <laughs> all right. We're done. I should. All right. So um, please continue to put them into the chat box. But um, Sada, you want to come out of the... Um, presentation so we can see each other in gallery view and with that um, let's start uh, sharing our 
you know, what, what are your top ingredients and with that maybe some insights as you were reconstructing um, family, well-being, work, and friendship? Let, let's do one for each. Who wants to uh, share an insight for their family? Yes, Annette. I have um, Bob and Annette, love and life companions. That's my husband. I love it. Did you have an insight? Yeah. As you um, were doing these? Our, our, our trust and reliance on each other has grown deeper during COVID. I love that. Sounds like you turned a challenge into an opportunity. Very cool. Okay. Who, who would like to go on friendship? Christine, please. You're on mute. Try one more time. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. Cultivate, cultivate the art of being silly. <laughs> cultivate the art of being silly. I love it. <laughs> Beautiful. Do you have Do you have an example? Because I I want to learn to do that. Uh, I don't know. It's so, a, a lot of the time. I, I, it's hard for me to be anything else. I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it's sort of I don't know. It's just being lighthearted. You know, it's just um, I, yeah, um, playful. I guess is really a good analogy for me for being silly, you know? I love it. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that. I'm going to put that in my, um, I have a daily questions thing that I do with one of my friends. So being silly is going to be one, one of my ads. <laughs> Thank you. And then I hope we can be silly together in New York. Soon. I'm sure we will be able to. Yeah, as soon as they as let soon as, <laughs> as soon as you come out of your quarantine. Right. <laughs> Love it. Okay, who would like to talk to well-being? I, I will. John King. Hi, John. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> to try and live mindfully rather than emotionally. Um, it's so easy to respond rapidly with, without thinking through things. And to live mindfully, to me, includes... Um, <clears throat> You know, thinking things through and um, and seeking balance um, between all the things that make life rewarding. That's so beautiful. And John, do do you have any um, kind of tricks for us in terms of how you um, how I do that? You're more mindful. Yeah. How do you I, do that? I listen daily. I listen to the Calm app. If any of you are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 10 minute, I, I listen to it in the morning and it helps me with, with breathing and it's teaching me tools on how to, to slow down and enjoy the moment rather than be constantly fretted about the past or the future. Um, so Beautiful. I'd like, to get her, I'd like to get her on as a guest speaker, but I, I gotta figure out how to do that and see if she's interested. But I think um, there's something there for all of us, so. That Elise, would be so I, cool. Elise, can I make a comment? Or Sure. Who's this? It's Charles. Charles, please. Um, what I find uh, with well-being and, and going on, on John's comment, I think our hobbies bring us a lot of well-being, and we need to look at our hobbies as an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to use uh, what John said. Like, I do woodworking and photography. Um, I guess those are kind of different, but if you look at both of them, both of them teach you, you know, if you focus on photography, looking at the, at something that somebody doesn't see, people could walk by things and never see it, but a, photo, a photographer will capture something that will be very emotive to a lot of people because for whatever reason. In woodworking, it's a little bit different. You go and do woodworking, you have to be in the moment, you know, same with photography. You have to live in the moment at that time. You can't be thinking about 50 other things or you'll cut a finger off, you know? 
on a table saw. So uh, the other thing that, that woodworking has taught me in, in kind of John's comment is you, um, you need to deal with, with uh, failure because you will make mistakes, whether you're a cook, a, a, a photographer, a woodworker, whatever. The question is, how do you recover from those mistakes? And that brings you well-being too, because you make accomplishment from something that you've, you've done and then you had to correct for it, right? You, you cut something wrong and you had, to re you, had to re you had to figure out how to solve that problem. And you get a lot of confidence and development out of that. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Beautiful. It absolutely makes sense. Thank you, Charles. I'm so glad you could come um, because we, Charles and I just uh, exchanged notes on LinkedIn uh, this afternoon. So uh, thank you for giving uh, the RT a, a try, Charles. I hope it'll be one of, it'll become one of your hobbies. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that brings us to work. I, I have one for work. Um, Please. Sorry. Um, um, learn, earn, and return. So first you learn your skills, then you earn money at it, and then you return it back to um, and bring people along with you and help everybody you can uh, succeed. I love that. Learn, earn, and return. Denise, thank you. And Ken, you wanted to say something. I was going to say, learn, earn, and return. <laughs> but, uh, no, no uh, that was very good. I like that. Um, for work. Um, that, that, uh, that was a good courage. example of si silly. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Right. <laughs> Go, Saul. Um, I would say, uh, I guess this is based on today, um, courage creativity, uh, productivity, and, uh, and no procrastination. So avoid procrastination. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I wonder, did anybody include procrastination as one of their um, ingredients? No, but it's a good one. Actually, it's a good one. You know, there, there's a there's a <laughs> something about procrastination that uh, I've been a chronic procrastinator, but I, for some reason, I'm also very productive. I don't know how that makes sense, but uh, I think it was about a year ago I read an article in the Times written by a chronic procrastinator, which helped me a great deal. He said that he he was not a procrastinator; he was a precrastinator. Meaning that he, even though he thought he was wasting time, he was actually, everything was happening in his brain. So when he was ready to pull the trigger on it, he did it instantly. So I may be more of a procrastinator than a procrastinator, but sometimes it feels like procrastination. That, that's so cool. Uh, and Ken, just, you can play, right? Try and leave out uh, procrastination as an ingredient, try life without it. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that it's not, you're, you're, you know, it's not as interesting as it used to be, go back to washing the dishes instead of doing your drawings, you know? It's, right. <laughs> exactly. and, uh, and uh, Jack, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, knowing where you want to be going. Uh, follow your North Star. I think I think I and everybody need a compass to guide us during these turbulent times. And uh, if you know where the end is, you might find the path to get to it. That's so beautiful. Can I can I follow up on Ken a second? It's Scott. Sure. Hi, Scott. Yes. I, 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 a long time ago, I, I was mentored by some people I respect in my field a great deal, and as a person who spent about 30 years being a filmmaker, the, the kind of the running notion of procrastination in our world was that if left to our own devices, we would fiddle and re-edit with something forever 
The only thing that ended the procrastination or the constant feeling was that someone finally put a deadline on it. Mm -hmm. But if left to our own devices, and that's kind of the way I procrastinate, I will fiddle on something and revisit it every day, every day, until mm -hmm. someone finally calls time. You know? <laughs> but it's a, way, it's, it's a way in which I kind of procrastinate, but I try to make that productive. Yeah. You know, even though it may become a bit OCD and a little bit, you know, maybe too hyper focused on things, but that's um, th that that little comment has ridden with me my entire career, uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, yeah. Dead deadlines can be your friend. That's beautiful. They can save us from ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I. Um... One of my favorite, I just um, posted one of my favorite articles uh, on writing from Richard Ford. I adore reading Richard Ford. And uh, he had written in the Times, I think like 10, 15 years ago. And he, he talks about how he procrastinates until he runs of, out of everything he can imagine. And that's when he starts writing. And I love that model, and I want to grow up into that model, and um, still working on it. <laughs> I have two minutes. We have two more minutes. Okay. So um, I also wanted to uh, share something that I've been doing that has a, a lot to do with reconstruction in terms of making choices. There, there is a simplicity to making choices. Sometimes um, it doesn't matter quite what the choice is, but the act of making a choice in um, finding clarity and focus. Um, I learned the trick from a, a woman CEO who um, leads this amazing comp company called WES, W-E-S. Her name is Melissa Smith. And... Um, we were on a Zoom call and she mentioned in passing that what she does is every day she lists th three things that she plans on doing. And, and she does those things. And I thought to myself, that sounds crazy. Like how could you list three things in a day? Um, but given that she's a successful CEO, I thought, okay, I need to tr try this. And I've been trying this for the last month and a half. And um, here's, Here's my to-do list from yesterday. It only has three things. And these three things, so yesterday I uh, had an Instagram live with um, Cindy Allen, who's the ch editor-in-chief of Interior Design. And so Cindy, I worked on my FASCO presentation and Seda and I had Signify, which, is, um, which was a client meeting. And I did these things and it gives me great clarity and comfort to be able to know like in the morning, these are the three things I'm going to do. Now, having said that, hold on. <laughs> All right, this is my other to-do list. All right, so <laughs> it doesn't mean that I only do three things. I mean, come on, <laughs> I, I have emails to answer. I have kids to feed, all those good things. But those three things, um, Jack, you were mentioning North Star. I think there, there is a meta North Star, but underneath that meta North Star, there are some small stars. And these are my three little stars a day kind of thing. And then everything else that kind of fills in the, the spaces in between. I hope you'll give that a shot because that has really helped me. And maybe you already practiced this, but I just wanted to share that because it reminded me of that's actually reconstruction just done at uh, a daily pace. So with that, uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the perfect time for me to drop the mic and for Michael to catch it. Michael, here you go. Bing. And I'm very, very happy to introduce you, everyone. Michael Roderick is an amazing uh, human being. He lives in New York. He is a super connector. He has an, an amazing network. I think um, having you, Michael, here 
has um, given new sense to six degrees of separation. We're now <laughs> two degrees of separation from everybody we can imagine. And um, when I talked to Michael, Michael said, I'm going to teach everyone how to get people to talk about you when you're not in the room in a good way. So with that, Michael, you take it. Thank you for coming awesome. today. Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so basically, uh, one of the things that I have been focusing a lot of my time on recently is the idea of referability. And uh, this really started because I have lived in the marketing world. I've sort of uh, known a lot of people within that space. And what I found was that for a very, very long time, people were in essence kind of worshiping differentiation. And we were always sort of pointing out this you know, aspect of like, if you are different enough, then you're going to be successful. And in the marketing world, so many people have sort of taken that and then said like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to be different, that everybody's different has now become the same. Uh, so a lot of things sound very, very similar uh, when you start to look at people sort of standing out in this like thought leadership kind of world. So what I started to look at was I started to look at if you took that aspect out, like what's even stronger than differentiation? And what I realized was it was referability. It was whether or not people would actually talk about you and talk about your ideas when you weren't in the room. So then I started to ask, okay, well, if that's the case, what actually makes something referable? How do we create a referable brand? And what I developed was uh, a series of frameworks and, and pro processes to sort of think about this idea. So I'm going to introduce you all to a couple of those frameworks today. And I always uh, like to say before I start talking about frameworks, that I'm a very big fan of frameworks versus formulas. Uh, I, in a formula scenario, I'm telling you what to do. I'm saying, say it this way, do it this way. And when I do that, all I'm doing is creating a bootleg version of me, which is not going to work, right? But if I give you a framework, what I'm doing is I'm giving you a different way to think about things. And then you can bring yourself to that process. You can bring who you are to those ideas. So that's one of their core reasons why I focus on this idea of frameworks. So the main framework around creating a referable brand is relatively easy to remember because it spells the word aim. So you're going to think about three things. You're going to think about taking aim when you're thinking about creating a referable brand. And those three things are accessibility, influence, and memory. So I'll start with accessibility. Most of the time, what tends to happen is that we end up associating with a lot of people in the same industry as us or in the same group as us. So we start to develop a lot of jargon within that industry. And we create what I like to refer to as the echo chamber of the enlightened, where everybody is sort of agreeing with everybody else that, oh yeah, we totally understand what you're saying because we're all in the same, we're all in the same world, we're all using the same language, but you go outside of your industry and you try to talk to somebody who has never been in your world or worked in your world. And a lot of the time they're just like, I don't understand it at all. So one concept that I have found has been really, really effective. I refer to it as finding your Celine. And it comes from this really interesting story about how the song Hey Ya uh, became a hit. So for those of you who are familiar with it, it's, uh, it's the story's uh, featured in The Power of Habit, uh, which is a really, really great book. But there's lots of different accounts of this. But basically what happened was when Hey Ya was first introduced on the radio, people turned it off almost immediately. And the reason for that was that the sound of Hey Ya was actually very, very different than most pop songs. Like most pop songs that come on the radio have a very uh, sort of early bridge that kind of gets you you know, up uh, and then hits the, you know, the sort of like core refrain and then kind of goes and hey, ya starts like kind of almost in the middle. So for a lot of people, they were actually turning it off right away. So what the radio stations did, which was really a move of brilliance, was they actually put uh, artists who had sounds that basically all of their songs ended up sounding the same. They would sandwich hey, ya between those two artists. And one of those artists was Celine Dion. So if you've heard a Celine Dion song, congratulations, you've heard them all, right? They all have a very, very similar structure, very, very similar sound. So orally, it's actually much easier to listen all the way through. So what happened was people would listen to Celine Dion, and then on the other side of Hey Ya would be a Maroon 5 song or a more familiar concept. And what would happen is people would actually listen all the way through because they were trying to get to the reward of that easier sounding song. 
So as innovators, from an accessibility standpoint, most of the time what we're trying to do, especially entrepreneurs, is we're trying to introduce the world to our hey ya, when really what we should be doing is finding our Celine. We really want to try to figure out what is the anchor that we can give somebody to understand our concept before we introduce the innovation, before we introduce the, the, the new idea. And this really just comes down to uh, what I like to refer to as the timeline of trust, right? Like in the early stages of listening to somebody, if you are, if they're instantly telling you about something new or different, a lot of the time you're just kind of like, oh, I'm not really sure. But if they reference it in the context of something that you already know, and then they introduce the innovation, you're actually much more likely to listen and, and pay attention to it. So there's a lot to go into and talk about accessibility, but uh, I'm keeping with our, our time frame, so I'm going to move right into uh, I'm going to move right into influence. Um, so, uh, could you yeah. just say like what's the one takeaway for accessibility? Is it the fact of is it the find your Celine Dion moment and then go to Hey Out? Would that be the takeaway? Yes, that would definitely be the takeaway. Identify the thing that everybody or a very large portion of people can get, give them an anchor in the familiar so that you can take them deep with your innovation okay. is really the way that you want to think about it. Um, so moving on to influence. What's really interesting about influence is that for a very, very long time, we've learned about the idea of influence in the context of persuasion because Robert Cialdini made influence a very, very popular topic, right? By basically creating all these ideas of like weapons of influence and like, how do we get persuaded? But when we actually look at real influence, when we look at whether or not people share things, what I discovered was that most of the time, real influence is people sharing things without you actually asking them to share them. You're not coercing them to do it. They do it on their own. And at the heart of it, they do it on their own because it makes them look better. So most of the time when you're taking, when you're thinking about your ideas, a lot of the time what tends to happen is we're trying to sort of convince people of our brilliance, right? We're trying to sort of be like, here's all the cool things that I'm doing and here's all the neat stuff. And we're not thinking about if somebody else were to share this, how would it make them look? And one of my favorite examples of this is the classic start with why uh, Simon Sinek TED talk, right? So tons and tons of TED talks out there on leadership and lots of different ways of viewing leadership and thinking about leadership. But that talk became very, very popular for and, and shared quite a bit and had a ton of influence for a very, very simple reason everybody could draw a circle and look smart in front of their friends in less than a minute. If you think about it, all you had to do was do that circle and say to somebody, start with why. And all of a sudden you looked like you looked like the genius. You looked cool. You looked interesting. So a lot of the time when we're thinking about influence, it's not about trying to convince somebody to share our idea. It's about packaging our idea in such a way that people would basically say, oh, I need to show this to other people because it makes me look good. This is why Myers-Briggs has done so well and a lot of these evaluation systems and processes because we like to look good in front of our friends. We like to have these moments where like, hey, look at this cool talk I did, you know, et cetera. Perfect example is earlier in this thing, we all know about procrastination now because somebody else basically gave a very, very simple way of breaking down that particular idea. And what it did was it made uh, that person look good by explaining it. We're all like, oh, thank you. That's such an interesting concept. So you always want to think in your own work, how are you making this something that somebody else would want to share because it will make them look better? Uh, and I often will say to people, give yourself an F. Don't think about the aspect of what you do. Think about what you do for other people right? Like always think about, so like, don't think about what is this concept going to do? What is this concept going to do for somebody else? Is it going to make them look interesting? Is it going to make them look as if they're funny? You know, any of those types of things. So I'm going to move on to the last one because it's a doozy, which is memory. So here's the thing that's really, really interesting. Most of the time we spend all of our time focusing on how we tell the story when really what we should be focusing on is how easy it is to retell the story. 
So if you want people to remember your ideas more and actually retell the things that you're talking about, then you will need to focus on less. And that is L-E-S-S, -S, which is language, emotion, simplicity, and structure. So the first is language, and this is really important. Most of us know who Shakespeare is, but uh, if you didn't study literature, you probably don't know who Christopher Marlowe is for one very, very simple reason. Shakespeare added new words to the English language. If you go to the dictionary, you will find words that Shakespeare created. And the thing is, if you come up with your own words, people will then basically carve a piece of mental real estate in their minds for those words. Perfect example was the procrastination scenario, right? For some people, even today, the idea of bread for baklava is going to be something that's going to stick in their head because it's this like different way of, of thinking. It's a whole other type of language, right? So there are elements of this that are going to work. Second is emotion. So what's really, really fascinating about emotion is that when we are in a heightened state of emotion, our brains become like a sponge. So we actually remember more details and heightened states of emotion because biologically that's what was meant to protect us. If we didn't know that this was the tree that the tiger jumped out of and we didn't remember where that tree was, we were dead. And that part of our brain didn't go away. We still have it. So when we have a heightened state of emotion, we remember more details. And this is one of the core reasons why when you go to a TED talk or a presentation, you often see some sort of emotional story before they introduce you to whatever their concept is. You will see it time and time again, because at a heightened state of emotion, we'll actually remember more details. And the perfect pop culture example of this is I can ask everybody on this call right now if they could tell me any details of the opening scene of Titanic. And most people are gonna sort of rack their brain and try to figure it out. But if I say to every single person on this call, what comes to mind, which images come up for you when I say I'll never let go, you instantly have images in your head as a result of that because there was a heightened state of emotion during that portion of things. So emotion basically helps solidify memory. It helps uh, people sort of get to that place. And most of the time when we're thinking about our own language, our own material, we're not tapping into that enough. We're not giving people the opportunity to relive emotional experiences and latch on to our concepts and latch on to our ideas. The next is simplicity. And this is a really, really interesting one because academics uh, traditionally have always rewarded complexity. You were always rewarded for using the big words and writing the big papers. And for a lot of people, what that has done is that's actually translated into our thought leadership. We kind of get into this place of, I wanna use big words and make you think I'm smart and do everything that I can to sort of impress you. But the memory rewards simplicity because our memory can only hold so much information at any one given point in time. So the simpler you make an idea, the easier it is for somebody to carry that idea and transfer it to somebody else. And going back to what I was talking about with the influence side in terms of how you look in front of other people, if I started this and said, here are the 32 points of creating a referable brand, it'd be very, very hard for you to go and be like, oh, I learned these 32 points and try to explain it to your friends and not feel like you're gonna forget something. But if I just say accessibility, influence, and memory, and it spells the word aim, it's much, much easier for you to transfer that information, which leads to the very last point, which is structure. Our brains need structure. We don't start a book by reading, going in the middle and then bouncing from side to side. We start at the beginning and we move through. If we're watching a film, we do the same exact type of thing, right? We need an order. We need a structure. This is why jokes have been a long around as long as they have because there's a structure and all we need to do is plug it in. This is why memes are so popular because it's just a, stru a structure and then we plug the idea in. So the thing is, if you focus on language, emotion, simplicity, and structure in the creation of the work that you're doing, you're actually going to create things that are easier for people to remember, easier for people to transfer that particular information. And when you want people to talk about you when you're not in the room, if you have an accessible idea, something that gets them interested that they kind of already get and they're like, okay, I totally understand this and it makes them look good. So it already has influence in terms of them wanting to share it. And then finally it has this level of packaging 
that is so easy to remember and so easy to share, they're going to share that idea faster than other people's ideas. And this is why a lot of people who have really, really great content and great material end up basically being second fiddle to people who don't have really great content or material because those people have figured out how to make it easy for other people to transfer the information. So thinking about that idea of not necessarily how uh, well am I telling the story or how good is the story, but how easy is it going to be for people to retell the story is such an important point uh, about this. So again, if you are thinking about wanting to get people to talk about you and your ideas when you're not in the room, focus on taking aim, accessibility, influence, and memory. There we go. Wow. That was fantastic. Woo. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I feel like uh, Michael with the baklava idea, uh, it was accessible. Yeah. Um, it, um, you know, if people do ask their friends to try it out, it would, it yep. would mean that I've influenced them. And, yep. um, and then the, the names that were generated like bread lava or, <laughs> bread pistache or something you know th that yep. gets to the um the the language of it the i have, yep. I have halaklava i should i love it halaklava <laughs> it's no, easy to do michael, michael yeah, can you repeat just, it i i need to do it for for my my work and not the baklava part but okay <laughs> <laughs> I, Michael, can you repeat the three the three big takeaways that you just stated real, real quick? Sure. Accessibility, influence, and memory. Oh no, I got I got those notes. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No worries. Michael, can I ask you yes. who the the person was that you were talking about that did the um, you were referring to um, influence and start with a Y? And you're yes. talking about this TED Talk. Who was that person you referred to? That was uh, Simon Simon Sinek. Okay. Yeah. Is that, a, that must not be a real name. <laughs> uh, it's very, I mean, um, you know, a lot of these folks do sort of adjust their names uh, when they're, you know, when they're sort of getting out there. So it's possible that, yeah, it's, it, it's possible that he may have had a name change or it could actually be his name. You know, Cynic. You never oh, know. Interesting. Michael, this was this was just fantastic, and oh, everyone. Thanks. Michael is, you know, as you can see, he's brilliant, but also um, accessible. He <laughs> has influence, and he's memorable. So with that. Uh, Please reach out to him. And Michael, uh, could you please put in the um, link for your daily email into the chat? Sure. Uh, Michael right has now. the best daily uh, newsletter or email. So I hope that Thank you. Um, you can get that started. It's a pleasure to read in the morning. And that's how actually I reached out to Michael because he said something and I thought, oh, you know, this is really interesting and then wrote to Michael and Michael thank you for for joining us so with yeah that, thanks so much for having me it's a blast <laughs> yeah <laughs> I show um, yes um did you yes. put the link in for your meeting that you were going to have I did and but you could do it again just coming right now okay um, it's right here there we go. It's our October 24th Design the Life You Love full length workshop where you get to see the entire deconstruction reconstruction process from the beginning to the end and design the life and work you love. And we have a discount code virtual T if you want to take advantage of that. Actually, um, the, I, I was I talking think, about the You meant the, the fast talk. company. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that, also that's in, in there, there as well. Yeah. And I just put it again. Okay. Thank you. Did, did I miss the Cindy Allen um, interview? Oh, and the Cindy, Cindy Allen one, uh, uh, Matam is going to repost that, I think, in Instagram. Yeah. So yeah. you can, and actually that, um, Seda, if you want to put the um, slideshow back up, 
and I had a little moment of promo. So show the Philips thing. Exactly. Um, so we've been doing just, just a second of, uh, I wanted to share something that we did that was really exciting and that's, um, we did the um, virtual teas with the, um, the Philips global design team. And so every week for an hour, twice a day, um, they would gather around the um, virtual table to um, deconstruct and reconstruct their work and life. And the, uh, if we go to the next slide, Helene, who is the design director at Philips, um, said that um, you know, at the end, basically, that this created a deep connection and intimacy across their team and that who could have imagined that we could achieve this virtually. So I, I, I felt so good about this, that um, you know, a company like Philips um, using our tools to come together um, virtually and that, that left them with a deeper connection. And so um, I just wanted to say that as well as um, here is, if you want to follow us on Instagram and um, see me talk with um, Cindy Allen, it's uh, Design the Life You Love, um, also on Facebook and on Twitter. So I hope um, we can follow each other and also definitely follow uh, Michael on all these um, connections and on LinkedIn. So thank you everyone. Um, so that if you want to come back, I'll say goodbye to, yeah. <laughs> it was lovely seeing you. I hope you'll come back. And when you do come back, um, remember, I hope you'll bring a friend who's nine years younger and nine years older. The age is just the you know, reference point, but we love the idea of having uh, young kids and older kids together. So to play together. Thank you so much and see you Perfect. next time. <laughs> Take care.